Aloha. I found, I know other YouTubers do this where they do, you know, like about myself kind of things. And so I went in and I found a list of tag, what they call tag questions. Um, there's like 350 questions on this one. I'm not going to answer them all right now. I figured I'd just do a few a week and, you know, go through. And I kind of want to do them blind. So, you know, I looked over the first few. It's like, okay, I'll do the ones about who I am, you know, my name kind of things and then go from there. Um, so the first question is, what is your full name? Marissa Culp. Exciting, huh? <laughs> uh, what does your name mean? I've actually done a little bit of research on this. Marissa is a derivation of Mary. That's really about it, you know, and Mary goes back to the Virgin Mary from the Bible. So it's like, what is it? It's like sainted or pure or something like that. I'm getting notices on my phone. <laughs> Are you named after anyone? No. <laughs> I did ask my mother about this one time when I was little. How did I get my name? Because when I was in school, nobody had my name. And I would get what I thought were old ladies, I, they were adults basically, <laughs> would always say, oh, such a pretty name is so unusual. And so I asked my mother how I got my name and she said she found it in a baby book, you know, list a uh, book of baby names and she liked it. Again, interesting story, story of my life. This is the way my life is, you know, but I found that once a soap opera used the name in the late 70s, early 80s, a lot of people started naming their babies Marissa. By the time my daughter got to junior high, or middle school, they call it now, when I was in school it was junior high. Um, but by the time my daughter got to middle school, she was in band, so we'd go to the band concerts. And she had what I thought was a, an unusual name, but there would be seven other of her name, and then there would be seven other Marissas. And I used to, when I was little, I didn't like my name so much because it was unusual. And I wanted to be Mary or Sue or, you know, something that everybody else had. I wanted to be like everybody else. As I got older, I liked having the unusual name. I liked being the only one with my name. And that's how I like it now. I like it when nobody else is my name. Now I actually, I work with vendors who have my name. And it's weird. It's like, hi, Marissa. This is Marissa. And... I guess, you know, when you are a Mary or a Sue and you get that all the time, it's like not a big deal, but for me it's kind of weird because I never had that when I was little and all of a sudden it started and I'd rather go back to being my unusual name. <laughs> so um, does your name make any interesting anagrams? Not really. <laughs> if I use, you know, I mean, M-A-R-I-S-S-A, -S -S -A, that doesn't really do anything. Um, if I do my first and last name, I came up with Carissa Plum, who could be Stephanie Plum's wacky aunt. I would love that character. I would love to be that character, Carissa Plum. You know, um, just joining her on like like her like Stephanie Plum's grandmother that joins her on the wacky adventures in the funeral parlor and everything, just that kind of character where she's just kind of wacky and carries a gun and <laughs> um, whips it out of her purse and starts shooting in the ceiling. Um, if you had to change your first name, what would you change it to? If I had to, like if I were in witness protection, again, I'd probably choose something that was unusual. They'd probably give me Mary. <laughs> but 
you know, if if I could select my own name, I'd probably go through the baby book and find out find a name that was unusual. Um, let's see. I'll go a couple more. Where are you from? Um, I grew up in Hayward, California. I lived there until I was about 23, I think. Then I moved to Jackson, California for about six, seven years. Then I moved to Bend, Oregon. Then I lived in Deschutes County for almost 25 years. And then I moved here to Hawaii where I've been for Let's see, it's 2018, so I've been here for seven years. At this point, I don't plan on moving again, but you never know. Uh, where were you born? I was actually born in a hospital in Oakland, Oak Knoll Naval Hospital. Uh, but I lived in the same house in Hayward for, you know, my whole childhood. It's one of those neighborhoods where everybody tends to stay. I grew up with the same kids, we, you know, we went to kindergarten through high school all together, you know, so we all knew each other. Um, where did you grow up? Here in California. Who did you look up to growing up? I never really had any of those, you know, oh, role models. I. I wish I had. There are a lot of things I wish that had been different about my childhood, but I mean, I just had this like boring, easy childhood. There was nothing outstanding about it. There was nothing that made it special. Um, you know, it, I'll have to think about that one and maybe answer it again another day if I can come up with something. Um, okay, the next questions are kind of personality things, so I think I'll leave those for another time and we'll just stop right here for now. And I will talk to you later. I'm probably going to insert something else up over here or I'm going to end it here. I'm not sure if I'll do something else first or after. I haven't figured out how I'm going to wrap these in. So I'll talk to you later. Bye. I found this article um, that I wanted to do a fun little thing on. Um, fun. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I actually, it was published in September in Time Magazine and I saved it, you know, I pasted it onto my desktop and I just found it last night and so I thought, oh, okay, I'll go back and do this. So it's nine ways being single can improve your life. A little departure, but kind of interesting. Uh, like I said, it was Time Magazine, online, of course, uh, written by Candace Jalili. Maybe I'm saying that right. Um, but I've been single all my life. I never married. Um, Pseudo-engaged one time, but yeah, we won't go there. I've only had a couple of long-term relationships that were not good. They were not healthy. And I have come to the realization that I will never be married, just, just the way it is. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know why, I can't explain. Now I'm so set in the way I live my life, I can't see somebody else coming into it and me being able to accept that this person, you know, has their own way of doing things that is not my way of doing things that I would have issues with <laughs> because I am so set in my ways. Um, so, with that in mind, <laughs> nine ways being single can improve your life. Um, and the con, you know, the the concept, and it's it's not um, 
a modern concept. This is the way it's always been. And unfortunately, it's still like this, even though we are kind of starting to get away from it, is that you aren't truly complete until you've found your soulmate, your other person. And so people kind of view their, you know, people view single people as living these incomplete lives and, um, you know, how can you be happy if you're single, if you don't have that someone to complete your life, if you don't have a family, you know, and even if somebody is, does not have, or does have a person, you know, does have a mate, a soulmate, whether it's a soulmate or maybe not a soulmate, but somebody they've chosen to stay with, um, you know, maybe they've chosen not to have a family and that is perfectly fine as well. Some people already know that they might not be cut out for parenthood. They might not have the mindset to take care of small children and I'm not sure that I had the mindset even though I went ahead and did it. So, you know, it's, you know, and there are plenty of people out there that should not be parents that are. So, you know, I can applaud those people that realize in advance and choose not to have children. I, I give them credit. Um, anyway, back to this. Um, single lives are often portrayed as a sort of purgatory they're forced to endure until they find their soulmates. A 2008 study published in the European Journal of Social Psychology found that single people are often thought to be unhappy by other people. Not so much by themselves, uh, you know, their own perception, but by other people. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, and this is the last week of, the last day of Halloween. So that's why my t-shirt. Um, I love this. It glows in the dark. So, you know, I've got the, the chest full of cap, the candy, and then my fun little witch earrings, which I really should have worn with the, when I had the green face. And, oh, I should show you that. That really wrecked havoc on my skin. I'm looking that way instead of that way. Um, yeah, that wrecked havoc on my skin. Here's a photo. Just so you can see. And then I did... Um, that was on Monday, and because the makeup was so intense um, on, and that green is actually, I couldn't get costume makeup because it was all made in China, and um, so I won't put it on my skin because that means it's, they've tortured animals in order to make it. So I found some wet and wild green mascara that I put on. It was just horrible on my skin. I'm still trying to recover. And so the next day I just did like gold glitter and wore pumpkin earrings, which I think there's a video and it doesn't show up as well. You know, the makeup doesn't show up as well. But then on Wednesday, which was actually Halloween, I did kitty cat makeup and that's here. And that was fun. I liked that. Um, and then yesterday was um, Dias de los Mortes. I did the sugar skull clothes, but because I had done so much makeup previously, I and I woke up with a migraine, so I really didn't feel like getting intricate with makeup. And I could, I didn't have the white makeup to do the base with. So I just didn't do the makeup at all. I just did the clothes. And I think there's, uh, I don't know if there's a video of me in that or not. But, so that's my Halloween week. I always do a whole week worth of costumes for Halloween. Um, anyway, back to this. <sighs> um, okay, experts say those, that these stereotypes couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, the 2008 study also found that single people self-reported, so they reported about themselves, levels of well-being that was similar to participants that were in relationships. And the benefits 
that single people reported are, or that the experts say that single people have when um, your life is free of a romantic relationship, your mind is uncluttered. I don't know about that. My mind is plenty cluttered, thank you. Uh, relationships are mentally expensive. And this is a quote by Susan Winter, who is a relationship expert and author. Um, she says that time people spend in relationships, um, they spend worrying about their partners, even on the smallest quarrels, keeping them from living in the now. Um, Emotional discord can be all-consuming as it removes us from the present moment and the present situation. And that's true. You know, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about what's he doing, what's where's he going, what's he up to, what's what's going on, what did he mean by that? What, you know, all the all the crap. Um, you're more open to whatever life throws your way. You can be more. Um, spontaneous you don't have to stop and think oh or make phone calls you know well let's see if so-and-so wants to do that tonight and <coughs> uh, I should have brought my water with me um, single people can are more will are more willing to roll with the punches this is Nilu Dardashti a New York-based psychologist and relationship expert. When you're alone, you have to be more self-sufficient. And that is true. Um, I, because I've always been alone. I raised my daughter alone. I had to, you know, I had to do it all. And there are actually times when I think, oh, it'd be so nice to have somebody come in and just do everything for me, make decisions, take care of things. But I know that would also drive me nuts. I, I you know, I, I, because I am so set that I do these things already that I would not be able to let go. Um, now, according to what they say from Dardashti, um, this sounds like somebody who's been in a relationship and then is suddenly out of a relationship, not somebody who has not been in a relationship for a long time. Free from the constraints of having a partner, people's lives suddenly become totally and completely their own. Nobody hindering you from setting out to chase your ambitions. You're more likely to take risks and have adventures and have more novelty within your journey. Um, you know, and that's true, you know. Because you can, if you decide to go to Europe, you can go to Europe. If you decide to uh, just take a day off and go to the beach, you can do that. You don't have to worry about taking care of somebody else or whether they're going to agree with what you want to do. You have time to get in touch with yourself. Um, and this is back to Dr. Dardashti. People say a lot of times when they're in relationships that they've lost themselves, and that's largely because we stop doing things independently. Um, the less time alone to focus on their own personal, um, oh, because they have less time alone to focus on their own personal development. When you're alone, it creates opportunity for being more in touch with something inside of you. And she says that a common complaint she hears from patients in relationships is that they're feeling out of touch with their creative sides. When you're single, there's more room for creativity. Um, you know, she says being, you know, creativity and being in a relationship, you can do, but it's harder for an, the average person to balance the two. Sirens. Um, you have a chance to figure out what you want out of life. And I wish I had done that when I was younger. It would have made my life now much easier. Uh, this is Dr. Jenny Tate, clinical psychologist and author of How to Be Single and Happy, which I should read that book because the happy part I really need to look at. Um, Looks at being, Dr. Jenny Tates, looks at being single as your chance to figure out your own personal mission statement. 
This is the critical time to figure out who you are and what you stand for. So again, this sounds like somebody who's been in a relationship and is suddenly out of a relationship. Um, when we're not in a relationship, we really have some time to get clear about what matters to us and what we value. And that's something we should all sit down and figure out no matter what relationship status we have. Um, you can recalibrate and reflect on lessons learned from past relationships, which I think, again, we all need to do. Um, you have time and ability to focus on the one consistent factor that will create the change you're seeking for yourself. Uh, it can be the best case scenario. Being a, in a relationship all, isn't always the optimal choice for everyone. Let's go back to the beginning when I said. <laughs> um, and she said, this it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. If we think of three options, one option is, oh, and this is Dr. Tate still. If we think of three options, one option is to be happy when you're single. Another option is to be unhappy in a relationship. Another option is to be unhappily single. Well, how about happy in a relationship? Isn't that four? But she doesn't mention happy in a relationship. Being single and happy seems like the only viable option for someone who's looking for love and not finding it. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, that does make sense, you know. But, you know, there are people who are in relationships and are happy. So, I, I don't know. Um, I, and I guess they're just looking at being a single person. Though, as a single person, those are your three options. Um, so, um, in order to truly become happily single, she suggests practicing mindfulness living in the present moment, and it will enrich other aspects, other aspects of your life. You can strengthen friendships, get clear on what's important to you, design your best day. I don't know what quite that means. I mean, um, if you're spending your single time ruminating about how you're going to meet someone or what's wrong with you, you miss the opportunity that you know, you miss that opportunity, so you really want to be single with a smart headspace. And that's true. You don't want to be always be going around, you know, it's like, um, you know, how am I going to go out and meet somebody and, you know, what's wrong with me? Why, why can't I meet anybody? And that just, you know, I spent quite a lot of years on that and it doesn't get you anywhere. So... I figure, you know, there's that old adage that everyone has one soulmate out there and you just have to find them. I figure mine's living down at the South, at the South Pole somewhere or out in, you know, the middle of the darkest heart of Africa. And so our paths have never crossed. <laughs> or I met him and I was a bitch and so he walked away. <laughs> I like that one. Um, it's a chance to become financially responsible. See video. Um, <sighs> one of the perks people often attribute to relationships is the ability for both partners to share responsibilities and financial burdens. My point, my or my problem at this point is. If I share my financial burden with somebody at this point, it's going to bring them down. I would want, not want to do that to somebody. So, that's not a good thing. Uh, but sometimes, uh, this is Andrea Sirtash, relationship expert and author of He's, not, He's Just Not Your Type, and that's a good thing. Sometimes when you're single and don't share expenses with someone else, you push yourself to advance and to be resourceful because you're not relying on someone else to cover your expenses. Again, see video. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've never had anybody else to share expenses with. It's 
tough, especially when you're a single mom. But you do it because you have to. You, you don't rely on somebody else. You have to do what you have to do. And, you know, with the cancer, if I got to the point where I was going to have to live in my car, that's what I was going to have to do. You know, in order to pay bills, if I had to give up my apartment and live in my car, that's what I was going to have to do. You know, so you can make self-care a priority. Um, and this is from Dr. Winter. Did we quote from him her earlier? Uh, Susan Winter was the, the relationship expert from the beginning. Okay. Um, partnership can be wonderful. Um, you have someone you can share ups and downs with, but when we're single, we're required to focus on the areas of our lives that need attention. And that's true because your mind isn't split with, you know, other things and focusing on what you need to take care of. Um, you know, like using the cancer, you know, if I'd had to take care of a family, uh, I don't know how, you know, people with family, how women with families do this when they get sick. I, uh, I, my praise goes out to them. I, you know, wow. But having to take care of the family and having to deal with your own cancer at the same time, um, uh, you are the true goddesses that's for sure um, but you know for me I was able to just focus on myself and take care of what I needed to do um, it at the same time it would have been nice to have somebody there when I got home at night and could take care of everything but I kind of wonder if I would have felt that that person was in the way as well but then again because I know being alone that's what I'm used to so but if I'd been in a relationship for some time I, I may not feel that way I don't know um, you know it's it's hard to know what your life would be like on another rail um, so um, areas such as work um, she costs it okay focus on other areas of our lives that need attention. Um, working out, socializing with friends, taking time to focus on personal aspirations, and spending time alone often get pushed aside in relationships. So when you're single, there's no distraction that pulls you away from your own self-care and development. Uh, you learn to enjoy your own company. Being single doesn't necessarily mean being lonely. You can actually gain appreciation for your time alone. But a lot of single people are very gregarious. They go out and do things. They have a lot of friends. They're busy, active. It's not me. <laughs> but there are people that, you know, they, they rarely get a moment alone because they are so active and busy and have their circle of friends. So being content in our own company frees us from the need to chase others and this was dr susan winner um, when we learn to enjoy being alone we become more selective about the company we choose yes i have become very selective about that um, your confidence level can skyrocket okay <laughs> this goes back to dr dardashti when you're alone, there's a strength that almost has to be there. We tend to rely on our partners for a lot more than what we need to. As a result, she says that being single provides an opportunity to tap into one's inner strengths, which in turn can actually manifest in a greater level of confidence. Solitude, and Dr. Winter says, solitude breeds self-reflection and self-reflection self breeds confidence. Um, and then it goes on to say, and this confidence cultivated in solitude will, event, will eventually trickle into all of your relationships. Family, you know, extended family, friends, work, everything. 
Um, so Dr. Sirtash said, and, and I like this, this is the final paragraph, Dr. Sirtash. The best relationships occur when you have a good understanding of your needs, wants, and values. Being single allows you to focus on these things. Having this confidence and self-awareness will ultimately serve you in all of your relationships, not just romantic ones. So, being single can improve your life. So if being single can improve your life, why am I... <sighs> you know, I should be good at it by now. But, you know, I've never really been good at anything in my life. So, <laughs> why should I be good at this? But I thought it was an interesting article. And if you kind of apply it you know I know I'm not the only cancer patient that's single and having to deal with cancer and I know I know that there are cancer patients out there that are so much worse off than me and are single and trying to deal with it alone and you know God they're the ones that really really deserve the applause and uh, the the kudos for getting through their days and so you know the the best thing I like about being single I think is Just I'm kind of I'm just a solitary person. I I do like other people. I like to hang out. I like to go do things. And but I find that I need other people to get me out to do those things. And I like being alone. I like my I like my quiet. I like my alone time. Uh, what do you like about being single? If you're single, what do you like about it? If you're in a relationship, is there anything you miss about being single? You know, uh, let me know down in the comments and we'll compare. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.